Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. Uh, Declan made the mistake of saying to a preacher, remember I give you 50 minutes, but give or take. Uh, so I might take a little bit. When Declan made the contact with the request to speak at this event, I was acutely aware of two things. The first is to make it clear that I'm not here on behalf of the Archbishop of Canterbury or in any way representative of Lambeth Palace or the Church of England. I accepted the invitation out of a long-standing relationship and as someone who has been involved across the spectrum of political and community life in Northern Ireland, addressing the demands of reconciliation in a divided society for over 30 years. My involvement with ACONI, the Evangelical Contribution in Northern Ireland, the Civic Forum, the Community Relations Council, and the consultative group in the past are the more significant aspects of my being here today than my current day job. The second point was that whatever my misgivings, this was something I could not decline to do. 21 years ago, Tom Hartley and Mark Jean Amelier accepted an invitation to speak at a public gathering of mainly evangelical Protestants in the Belfast YMCA in February 1995. Over 200 packed the room for an honest and frank encounter, the first public participation by Sinn Féin representatives at a Protestant church-based event. Much has happened since then. Northern Ireland is a transformed society. Yet, after 10 years of democratic unionists and republicans at the heart of government, sharing the office of first and deputy first minister, there remains a need for deep roots to a process which is often driven by pragmatic political considerations <coughs> rather than a fundamental reimagining of a community at peace with itself. The uncomfortable conversations initiated by Sinn Féin in, in 2012, in which I have participated in England, by their very title, indicate what is required of us. Hard listening and honest speaking. My task today is to give a constructive critique in response to the policy document being released. As a conversation partner, I am not here to endorse a political party or its policy, but to engage critically with a policy which has as its objective the reconciliation of relationships with people like me and many of you who are here today. Time does not permit a detailed response. So I want to gather my brief comments around two themes, political and theological. Politics is the art of negotiating relationships. Relationships in which issues of power and identity, experienced through the narrative of historic hurts and wounds, are intrinsic to our ability to form communities based on equality and respect. There is much in this document about power, identity and hurt. Yet there is an assumption that Declan has already referred to that ultimately reconciliation will only be achieved through the uniting the island of Ireland into one state. Timothy Garton Nash is critical of reconciliation in the political sphere because it presumes we are being asked to be reconciled to something an authoritative account of the way things should be. The real partition in Ireland, as the late ATQ Stewart asserted, is not the lines drawn on the map, but in the hearts and minds of the people. Uniting Ireland is a legitimate political goal for Republicans to hold and to advocate. However, it falls short as the ultimate test of reconciliation which is essentially relational and not constitutional. There is much to be welcomed in tone and a commitment to working for good community relations and the healing of hurt of the last 40 years. It is clear from the document that much work has been done between the parties in agreeing the context and processes for dealing with the past. Like all stages of the political and peace process, we continue to build on the work of previous initiatives whose time was not right, but whose analysis still holds true. There are welcome commitments to a public policy framework 
and forums that can address the political task of building a reconciled community. Yet I am left with a distinct unease. There is an absence of any recognition or acknowledgement of the thousands in local communities and civic society who give of themselves during the worst days of the conflict to build community relations and hold us together. Good relations did not begin when Sinn Féin and democratic unionists came to share power and a programme for government together. Many led the foundations of the bridge you were able to cross. They did so because they thought it was the right thing to do. They were often dismissed as promoting an agenda which reduced the conflict to a sectarian squabble and not as the political struggle as defined by Republicans. Or the community relations industry was ridiculed by others as softening and blurring of the boundaries to prepare a unionist community for unacceptable concessions. Too many who stood in the gap during the years of conflict have been taken for granted. The parents who prevented their children and the children of others from joining a paramilitary group. Those who walked across the street or beyond the walls to build friendship and trust. They have laid the foundations on which your policy now depends. When I first heard Sinn Féin speak of reconciliation, I have to confess that my first reaction was, here we go again. Republicans have form in colonising language. Speaking of peacemaking, peace building, and now reconciliation. Often this has alienated their political opponents, maybe at times deliberately, from such language, and made their opponents appear not interested in peace. However, in using the word reconciliation, all political leaders in different peace and political processes around the world are using a profoundly Christian and biblical world word. From this context of a Christian understanding, it has appropriately transitioned and given meaning relevant to politics and to the restoration of broken relationships after conflict and violence. This was best exemplified in the process of reconcilia reconciliation in Europe after 1945, in, works in which the work of churches and religious organisations was integral to political, cultural and economic stability, not least the work of Coventry Cathedral, where I moved in 2008 to head up their reconciliation ministry. So I want to take the liberty of liberating the word from political colonisation by saying something of what the word reconciliation demands of you from its religious roots. It is not inappropriate considering the Christian faith informs many in this society in their civic participation, and whether we like it or not, undergirds many of the shared values we have as a community. Reconciliation demands that we deal with the hate and hostility. There is an anger that remains in our community. It derives its energy from many things, but most of all, from the distinction we make between us and them. Whether in political, religious or cultural terms, sectarianism is the original sin on which we have fueled our strife. The Polish philosopher Sigmund Baum speaks of the history of humankind in relation to the use of the personal pronoun we. We the people, defined in exclusive terms. Everything outside such collective identities could be summed up with the word other, those who are not us. Life in Northern Ireland is too often understood in terms of us and thoseans. Oppositional identity may be comfortable, for it is always someone else's fault, but its fruit is hate and hostility. In Christian terms, the need is for the robust, practical and political outworking of Jesus' command to love. Love for our neighbour, 
for the stranger, the alien, even for our former enemies. If future generations are not to inherit the hate, we need to exercise that hate and anger by moving beyond a us and those ones to a collective we the people that includes all who call Northern Ireland home and based on a commitment of mutual flourishing. Reconciliation also demands that we address the hurt that exists due to the cycles of violence over the centuries. In intercommunal violence, the hurt we have done to each other is always difficult to talk about, never mind find the capacity to heal the wounds. We rightly seek truth and justice, but they are harsh masters. They insist that each takes responsibility for their actions, and those culpable for choosing to inflict harm are held to account. However, they need to be tempted with mercy if reconciliation is to flourish. Without mercy, as Pope Francis has reminded us all during his year of mercy, a mercy expressed in forgiveness and, importantly, a willingness to be forgiven, there is, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu says, no future. And reconciliation demands that we face that future with hope. Political parties and leaders must be judged on their vision, their words and actions which speak of the flourishing of all and not just their community or electorate. Without such a commitment in which we embrace the future well-being of the other, there is little hope and policies and words about reconciliation will be found wanting. A culture of respect means we are respectful. An equal society defends the rights of all to cultural, religious, personal and political expression. Our wee country now seeks to find its agreed and reconciled future in a radically different global context from when the troubles began 50 years ago and even the peace process 20 years ago. We are not so much in an era of change, but a change of era. Sectarian strife within the Islamic world threatens to draw us all into a global conflict if it has not already done so. Bitter tribal and ethnic divisions destabilise states across Africa and historic enmities rise again in Central and Eastern Europe. There is an uneasy edge to our world. Forty years ago, I left Belfast for the first time to work in Lahore, Pakistan, and a year that changed me and informed my commitment to working for peace in Northern Ireland. I have quite literally just come back from Lahore, visiting this weekend the congregations of two churches devastated by suicide bombs. What I found there was a commitment by Christian and Muslim leaders to reconciliation in the face of hate and anger, a determination to overcome hurt. In recent years, over 60,000 Pakistani civilians have died in the violence, most of them Muslims, in sectarian attacks, and 4,000 military personnel. And there is a hope that flies in the face of circumstance that even there a better future is possible. In this year of centenary commemoration, as the lights once again flicker in our world and in many places do go out, the process here, however flawed, is a light to which many look and from which they take heart. Let us not be found wanting. Thank you. Thanks very much to Canon David Porter. We're now going to introduce our last speaker for today, which is Deputy First Minister Martin McGuinness.
Can I say, first of all, I'm, I'm delighted to be here with uh, Declan and with uh, David and, and with Kathleen for, for what is uh, an important event, uh, not just for Irish Republicans, but I believe, given the issue that we're dealing with here, something that has to be of uh, huge consideration for everybody within our society. Uh, I believe we've been on a remarkable journey over the course of the last uh, 20 years, and I suppose from the point of view of Sinn Féin and Irish Republicanism, I with others have been at the spearhead of uh, our contribution to these developments over the course of many years. And I think that it's uh, always important to reflect on how far we've come, and not to be complacent about where we are at the moment, and to recognise the uh, the work that has yet to be done. And I think David addressed uh, much of that in the course of his contribution. So we don't come along here expecting that people just listen to what we have to say or to heed what we have to say, but we also have to come along and listen very carefully to what others have to say and to heed also what they have to say. I think that's very, very important. Uh, people say, and they've said to me a number of times over the course of recent years, what, is, what does reconciliation mean to, to you? And of course the, the journey that we've all been on from the ceasefires and even pre the ceasefires, because David rightly said during the course of his contribution, he's not a Johnny come lately to the whole process of uh, peacemaking or reconciliation. He was always put their heads above the parapet. Uh, when others were not prepared to do so uh, a very, very long time ago. And we within Republicanism have always been very appreciative of the courage shown by people like David and the approach to inclusiveness, which is absolutely critical if we are, as a society, to uh, move forward. So uh, when you look at uh, uh, where, where we've come from, uh, and we look at even how what we have done here in this small place has actually inspired others to do similar things in their country. I mean, we, we had a visit three weeks ago from President Santos of uh, Colombia. And uh, the purpose of them coming here was to thank people here for the contribution that they made to the peace process in Colombia by our attendance at the talks in Havana between the FARC guerrillas and uh, the government. Uh, a lot of that began whenever I got a phone call from Ralph Meyer, who was the chief negotiator for F.W. de Klerk during the course of the negotiations with Cyril Ramaphosa <coughs> on, behalf of, uh, on behalf of Nelson Mandela. And, uh, and of course the trade unions here in the north uh, were, were also in contact with the Columbia for Peace organisation and doing great work also in trying to relay our story. But we sent a number of our representatives to Colombia to the talks and others uh, joined in from all our political parties. So all of our political parties made huge contributions towards trying to, by explaining what we had done here, uh, assist in bringing an end to a conflict that cost the lives of something like 220,000 people in uh, 40 years. And of course, with millions of people being displaced from their homes. So it's incredible to think that this small place can, can have an impact on conflicts which were, in, in terms of the enormity of it, much greater than the conflict that happened here. Uh, and of course, people in the Basque Country have also studied our peace process, and we have seen ETA and Harry Barasuna and others uh, also make massive contributions towards trying to resolve uh, the conflict in the, in the Basque Country. Uh, and of course we passionately hope that the Spanish government would recognise the importance of being courageous and moving forward into a negotiation uh, with those who have a different opinion from them. But how is reconciliation possible? Well, I don't think there's anybody in our society 
was it ten years ago that I would have imagined that Ian Paisley and I could have been reconciled, given the history of the past? Yet, whenever Ian Paisley decided to lead the Democratic Unionist Party into the political uh, institutions, uh, not alone were we able to develop in the year that he was in the office of First and Deputy First Minister a positive working relationship, we actually developed a friendship that lasted until the day he died. So what, what does reconciliation mean in that context? Did it mean that Ian Paisley became an Irish Republican? Absolutely not. He was a very proud Unionist. Did it mean I became a Unionist? Absolutely not. I was and still am a very proud Irish Republican. So I think David put a, uh, his finger on one of the challenges that we as Irish Republicans face in relation to our, our use of the term uh, national reconciliation. It doesn't require unions to become Republicans, and it doesn't uh, require Republicans to become unionists. And, and that's something that we as Irish Republicans and, and others within our society need to get uh, their head around. I spoke to Reverend Norman Hamilton downstairs just as we were having a cup of tea. And this thought was in my head even before I arrived here this morning. And then Norman's enormous contribution to that discussion, which only lasted about two minutes, was to make that point. And I think it is a point that all of us have to get our heads around, because if what is pre preventing people from becoming involved in reconciliation is the belief that we're involved in some sort of a ruse, or it's an attempt to trick people into becoming United Irelanders or Irish Republicans, well, well nothing could be further from the truth. And I say that as someone who is a United Irelander and who would like to see Ireland reunited tomorrow morning. But against the backdrop of recognising that we have made all sorts of very important agreements in the course of recent years, Good Friday Agreement, St Andrews Agreement, the Hillsborough Agreement, the uh, Stormont House Agreement and the Fresh Start Agreement. And what is absolutely critical for all of us is to be loyal to those agreements and to see all of those agreements implemented. And that doesn't just include the responsibilities of unionist leaders or Sinn Féin leaders. It also includes the responsibilities of the British government and indeed the Irish government in terms of uh, those agreements. So I think that is an important point to make at, at the outset because I do think that if there is uh, a notion out there which is preventing people coming forward in, in what is an undoubtedly a put your head above the parapet process, then they need to understand that we want them to come forward on their terms, not on our terms, and that we can deal with that, as I think they also have to recognise the importance of being big enough to deal with the fact that we are Irish Republicans. So uh, I think anybody that has, has heard me over the course of recent years, uh, I've been stressing that the next phase of our peace process must be the reconciliation phase. Uh, and it is something that I firmly and, and very passionately believe in. Uh, and it is something that I've tried to lead on. And I am therefore delighted to be here today to launch Sinn Féin's uh, reconciliation policy document, uh, which was endorsed by our Ardesh earlier this year. And I think Republicans have rightly embraced the challenge of reconciliation. And we do so because we recognise that the republic that we aspire to guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens. So if we are to give effect to those principles, then there is a duty on us to pursue uh, reconciliation with the same energy and vigour as we would any other aspect of our work. I think we have demonstrated uh, our commitment to this process through a number of public initiatives, which at times have also presented challenges for Republicans. And uh, indeed, I have been <coughs> criticised for some of the initiatives that I have been involved in. And uh, that does not discourage me uh, one bit from continuing to move forward and to fulfil my responsibilities as a political leader within our society. And we will continue to be imaginative and creative and take initiatives which enhance reconciliation and healing. 
But if our people are to be truly reconciled, this cannot be a one-way process. Neither can it be a process which is partisan or blind to the different narratives which exist and will always exist on the island of Ireland. A genuine reconciliation process must seek to create common ground with a collective focus as to build for the future. It must be defined by an acceptance of equality, respect and parity of esteem, an acceptance of different narratives and aspirations, and an acceptance that sectarianism and all forms of intolerance, prejudice, bigotry must be challenged and faced down. So that's the commitment which we as Republicans bring to this process, and we will continue to do so. I personally have taken several high-profile initiatives which sought to demonstrate our willingness to engage with unionism on the basis of equality and respect. And as I say, these initiatives were not easy for Republicans. They were challenging, they were difficult, but we do them in order to demonstrate to unionists our willingness to respect what is dear to them. But in order for that process to be successful, for our people to be truly reconciled, there does need to be a reciprocation of our efforts. There needs to be respect for all the traditions on this island, for all narratives. The Irish language, Irish identity, culture and aspiration is as valid as any other and needs to be respected as such. And that will require mature leadership from political unionism because, as Declan has said, we alone, we alone cannot deliver reconciliation. Reconciliation is a partnership, a partnership that requires leadership, a partnership that requires moving beyond the lowest common denominator and acting in our shared common good. In the absence of that, we are all condemned to an endless cycle of recrimination, which will only serve to frustrate everything that we are trying to build. And that, of course, impacts on our ability to collectively deal with such crucial issues as the legacy of the past. So how can we do that unless there is a recognition that there will always be different narratives of the conflict? The past will always be a contested space, but that's true of every conflict in history. It doesn't mean you can't build for the future once that uh, simple truth is accepted and respected. Similarly, it is difficult to see how we can make tangible progress on eradicating sectarianism and dealing with vexed issues such as parades, flags and emblems unless there is a genuine commitment across the political sphere to reconciliation based on mutual respect. And this includes respect for the Irish language, Irish identity, and respecting the experiences of niceness and Republican community. Without the shared responsibility to deliver reconciliation, the process will fail. And of course, we too have a challenge in terms of our ability to recognise uh, that, that we live in a society where there are people who are unionist and who are loyalist, who have very strongly held beliefs uh, and who also need to be respected equally, uh, uh, like ourselves. Uh, I'm uh, obviously convinced that as, as we go forward, we shouldn't be disheartened. I, I am convinced that there are many within unionism who recognise what needs to happen. And I'm regularly approached by people within the unionist community who do acknowledge the steps that Sinn Féin have taken and stress how much this means to them. So we will continue to offer that positive leadership and we will continue to pursue uh, the national reconciliation of our people on the basis that people can still hold on to their, uh, de their dearly held political allegiances and aspirations. And we, I think we can do that as Republicans. I think they can do it as unionists and firmly committed to our aspiration of a, a new Ireland which genuinely ch uh, cherishes all her children uh, equally. So, as I say, we've been on a, an incredible journey over the course of the last uh, 20 years and, and we have inspired people in other parts of the world, a world that is in a mess at the moment when we look at what is happening in Syria, what is happening in Iraq, what is happening in Afghanistan, what is happening in places like Nigeria and other parts of Africa, then I think it makes it all the more imperative that we don't slacken, that we don't give up, 
that we continue to work to reach this next stage of the process, which if we can do it, and I believe we can, uh, will further inspire people in many other parts of the world to recognise the importance of resolving conflict. Uh, in my journey through this process, I've met some uh, very uh, remarkable people from the Protestant churches. Of course, I've spoken about uh, Ian Paisley, and, uh, and my belief that once he decided to come in to the political institutions, that he was as passionate about the success of the peace process as I was. Uh, and there are countless uh, examples of how he displayed that. I remember whenever I was part of the Sinn Féin delegation that went to England to make the case that Derry would uh, get the accolade of City of Culture, and we were contesting against four or three other cities in, uh, in England. And uh, we went over and we made the submission and then we were to go back in a few weeks' time and the announcement was made live on the one show. And uh, we were all there. Our city got the accolade. I stepped off the podium. The very first phone call I got, immediately I stepped off the podium, was from Ian Paisley. And of course he had left the office at that stage and he said, I've just been watching you on TV. He said, this is a great result for our young people. And he was absolutely passionate right to the day he died, about uh, the success of everything that we were involved in. I would go over to his house, we would sit and talk for hours on the end, and I never had any doubt whatsoever about his uh, commitment to uh, the success of the work that we were engaged in, even though I was dealing with a different unionist leader at that time. Reverend David Latimer in my own city, uh, I never met David until he approached me about the state of First Derry Presbyterian Church, which sits in an absolutely magnificent location on Derry Walls, but it was a dungeon. They were having their services in Carlyle Road. Uh, the place was falling down around them, and they asked me would I assist in the restoration of his church, uh, and I did with all ours, and it is a remarkable place now, and he is a remarkable person who has also put his head above the parapet. I'm probably the only Sinn Féin leader that has spoken twice in the Presbyterian Church to the congregation, and that's something that I'm very proud of, because I think that clearly shows practically what can be done as we move forward. Uh, Reverend Harold Good, I just met Harold before I, I came here, uh, and the work that he has done in our peace process uh, has been absolutely remarkable. Another person has put his head above the parapet. And these are all, I think, fine examples of the tremendous amount of goodwill that exists right throughout our community. Uh, what we have to do is harness that goodwill. We have to enable people to put their heads above the parapet. I put my head above the parapet. I've met people that I never would have imagined that I would have met uh, publicly in, in, uh, in the past. And uh, I think in the main that has been well received. There has been criticism, and I accept the right of people to criticise, but we cannot be held back in the journey to reconciliation. We all have to continue to take... Uh, there, there was, I suppose, a phrase in the past where we talk about taking risks for peace, but we also have to take risks for reconciliation. And it will only happen if we are decisive, if we are committed, if we are dedicated, and if we make it possible. And I think that's the big challenge for... All of us, whether we be from the unionist community or from the nationalist republican community, to make it possible for each other to go together on that journey. I, I think that uh, the last thing I want to say is that I, I saw a movie uh, a number of uh, years ago. I actually said this at the, at the opening of the Peace Bridge whenever Peter Robinson was there a number of years ago in Derry. Uh, Into the Wild. It was about a Canadian... A uh, student who left the university, left his home, and went off into the mountains to live on his own. Didn't want to live with people, lived in a caravan, uh, went down into the town and got his goods and went back up and lived in the most horrendous conditions imaginable. And he'd done an awful lot of writing when he was there. His name was Christopher, and uh, he took ill and he died, and they found him dead in the caravan. And uh, on the wall of the caravan was scrolled a word, a phrase which said, 
happiness only real when shared. And I think that's the place we have to get to, and I think it's possible. Thank you. Thanks very much to Martin. Just before we conclude, just to, I know Declan made the point earlier, but just to say that Sinn Féin will be holding further public launches similar to this one in Dublin, Westminster and Brussels, and it's our intention then to use this important document as a tool for engagement within communities in the north. So just um, to say a very sincere thank you to our three speakers for their contributions and also to everyone for attending this morning. So, Gurmila Mogwif. <laughs>